I'm James Hitchcock, professor of history at St. Louis University, and this is the first of six lectures on the subject of Roman Catholic modernism, uh, which refers to uh, a school of theology and philosophy that uh, surfaced around 1900 and which was ultimately condemned by the church as a heresy and has remained one of the most uh, controversial episodes in modern Catholic history. What does modernity itself mean? Um, if you had, we, we conventionally divide history into ancient, medieval, and modern. Obviously, if you had asked Julius Caesar, for example, what period of history are you living in, he would have looked at you with puzzlement and would have said, well, I'm living in the present. And uh, if you had asked Thomas Aquinas, uh, what period of history are you living in, he would have said the same thing. Uh, everyone is living by definition in the modern age, whenever it is that they're alive. It was only much later that people started referring to the ancient world, or in the 19th century they coined the expression Middle Ages as the period between the ancient and the modern world. But one of the characteristics of modernity is that people have a heightened sense that they are living in a new age when things are different. Uh, they have a heightened sense of sort of discontinuity uh, between uh, the present and the past. Uh, they have a sense of the past becoming perhaps more and more remote and distant from them, not just in terms of years, but also in terms of the way people think and act. And that brings us into what can be called perhaps modernism. Modernity is the mere fact of being alive in modern times. And modernity has certain characteristics, which we will be talking about. But modernism rises to the level of an ideology or philosophy in which you become very conscious of the fact that you're living in modern times you become almost obsessed with what uh, characterizes modern, modernity. Uh, and you have, as I say, an increasing sense, perhaps, uh, that the past is receding, that the past is distant from you. And this has a lot to do uh, with the heresy of modernism. The word modernism, as it applies to the church, was actually coined by Pope Pius X, who was later canonized as a saint, uh, when he condemned the heresy of modernism uh, in 1907. And uh, we'll see later uh, what some of the full implications of that are. When does the modern world begin? Well, it's fairly customary in freshman college history courses perhaps to take the date 1500 as a convenient dividing line but you can push it forwards and backwards depending upon what criteria uh, you want to employ. Some people have identified the origins of modernity as early as the 14th century uh, with the philosophical movement that was called nominalism uh, because the nominalists uh, had serious doubts about the ability of the human mind to uh, really understand the truth. Um, they were not nearly as optimistic about human reason as Thomas Aquinas had been in the 13th century. So some people argue that uh, the, the, the retreat from the high philosophical tradition uh, of the Middle Ages and a kind of growing skepticism about reason uh, marks modernity. Uh, I myself don't think that that influence was the primary one. Beginning somewhat later than that, beginning perhaps around 1400, uh, is the phenomenon which we call the Renaissance. And certainly the people of the Renaissance, the scholars who called themselves humanists, were very conscious of a sharp break from what went before. Uh, they tended on the whole to reject or to criticize or maybe to ignore the high philosophical tradition of the Middle Ages, uh, which they viewed as too abstract, uh, 
uh, too remote from uh, human existence. The term Renaissance rebirth was not coined until the 19th century, but the idea is certainly there already in the 15th century. Uh, these people who want to see a rebirth of the classical civilization of Greece and Rome and look upon themselves as the people who are going to bring that about. Now, that's a very interesting idea, rebirth, in terms of modernity, uh, because uh, they don't use the rhetoric of saying, let's get up to date. Uh, they don't use the rhetoric of saying, let's move with the times. Uh, they criticize their predecessors, like Thomas Aquinas, by saying that he had departed too far from the early culture of the Greeks and the Romans. The Renaissance humanists are at least officially backward looking, not forward looking. They're conscious of living in a new age, but it's a new age that they think ought to be a rebirth of an old age, a rebirth of a time that was in fact dead. Around the year 1500, uh, occur some events which are going to have a profound impact on the modern world, although uh, their full significance was not realized until somewhat later, and that was the great age of discovery, uh, the, the age in which the Europeans began going out in all directions, across the Atlantic, uh, around the southern tip of Africa, and over to the Far East, sudden discovery by Europeans that there's a vast world out there with which they had very little contact. And their determination uh, to explore it, to discover it, to explore it, and to exploit it in various ways. There's been much discussion about what motivates the Europeans to do this. Why, at this particular moment in history, around 1500, they are so dynamic and aggressive and curious in ways that the other societies in the world of that time were not. There were other societies, notably China and Japan, that actually wanted to keep out the outside world, uh, while the Europeans wanted to sort of embrace the whole globe. Uh, in the long run, as I say, that will have a tremendous effect uh, in defining what the modern world is like, although uh, it will take a while before the implications of that are clear. Almost uh, simultaneous with the age, great age of exploration uh, comes the Protestant Reformation, uh, which begins effectively in 1517 when Martin Luther nails the famous 95 Theses to the door of the church. Um, this incident, uh, the nailing of the 95 Theses and the Reformation in general, has often, I think, been misunderstood. Um, the incident is a very dramatic one. Uh, Martin Luther nailing a document to the door of the church in which he calls into question certain teachings and practices of the church. Um, if today a Catholic priest, a uh, professor in a Catholic university were to do that, uh, nail some kind of a manifesto to a church door, uh, it would, of course, the, new, the television cameras would be there, the newspapers would be there, it would be seen clearly uh, as a dramatic act of defiance. Actually, Luther at the time was calling for an academic debate, and the church door was often used as a kind of a bulletin board. Nonetheless, the principle is still there. While Luther may have been surprised at the intensity of the reaction that he got, he then did stick by his guns and refused to back down. And uh, he found himself, perhaps in a sense, pushed farther than he may have originally intended to go uh, in terms of his questioning of Catholic teaching. Uh, 